Hi. It's a big room, big crowd. Um, I think some of you will find that some of the text on my slides is a little, just a little tiny. Um, you can always grab the slides from, um, from the app and kind of review them later. All right, so I'm, I'm Mario. I'm um, engineering manager at Meta, and I will talk to you about our uh, data center accelerators today. Um, so a little bit more about who I am and what does my team do. Um, you know, like, like the introduction said, we're, we're part of the firmware team. And basically with our many partners, uh, we work closely to deliver the, the data center accelerators um, for Meta. Um, being a firmware team, our primary objective, as you would expect, is to deliver firmware that's on time, works well, meets all of the expectations of all of uh, our many partners. This may seem somewhat obvious, but we have many partners, many, many partners, um, and they have many expectations. Um, don't, don't tell them I said that. Um, our focus, or my team's focus specifically then, is on, on testability and, and maintainability of software, um, and then on the, on the developer experience of, of these same um, firmware engineers. And so um, some of the biggest challenges kind of in that space then arise from having to smoothly integrate um, what do you all think of as best practices in both ASIC design and, and firmware development, right? A lot of, lot of things are kind of obvious to you, um, but meshing that with existing meta infrastructure, existing software infrastructure, as well as existing um, engineering culture is not always um, obvious or, or, or easy. Um, and so that's kind of where we, um, where we focus a lot. Um, and what we do, what we do is serious, um, but we, we don't always take ourselves seriously. Um, and so kind of in that spirit, I, I included here um, you know, a, a picture of two pineapples in space. It's, it's an inside joke, uh, but I also, I also put it up there to kind of test um, you know, my, legal, my legal department, see what they're gonna say about the copyrights, because this was AI generated, and so I was just kind of curious uh, what they're gonna say. Um, they didn't say anything, so you know, it's, still, it's still in here. Um, all right, jumping straight into what, what did we actually build? Um, so I can talk to you about two accelerators here. Um, on the left here is the, the Meta Training and Inference Accelerator. And then there's, there's another one we built it's called the Scalable Video uh, Processor. Um, I'm having trouble, I have to read these names because those were not the code names like at all when we were working on them, but they're, they're now the names of the, of the accelerators. Um, so the MTIA one is the, is the first generation AI accelerator, um, sort of designed for our internal workloads. It's an inference accelerator. Uh, I know there's training in the name, but the first one focuses on inference. Um, and it was fully co-designed, sort of a full stack solution, uh, all the way from silicon up to PyTorch and, um, and the recommendation models that we, uh, that we run on this thing. Um, as you would kind of expect, AI workloads are fairly ubiquitous at, at Meta at this point. Um, and you know, this, this is the accelerator that that's meant to work well with those, uh, with those workloads that, um, that we run. And so we believe, or strongly believe, uh, that we can, we can you know, achieve good performance uh, out of this thing, um, even better performance per watt, and that we can really crush it on performance per, per dollar. Right? That's kind of um, where, we're, where we're heading with this. Um, on the video processor side, this was actually the first in-house data, data center accelerator that we did. Um, and that one, was, that one is focused on video transcoding. All right, there's a lot of videos that we serve, whether it's video on demand, live streaming, or, or short form video. Um, and as we serve those videos, we try to match users' uh, connection speed. And so while we're matching the connection speed, we have to transcode the videos on the fly. And that can be done much more uh, efficiently, much more energy efficiently using, um, using the, the accelerator. All right, jumping straight into the architecture of, of the MTIA, of the Inference Accelerator. So all the hard work is really done by this eight by eight grid of processing elements here on the, on the left. Um, and each of these PEs is actually equipped with two processor cores, and one of them has vector extensions, and there's a number of kind of fixed function units. Um, both of these processor cores are based on the RISC-V um, ISA, but they're also customized, right? They're customized to perform the necessary compute and, and control operations for, uh, for, our, for our purposes. Um, if you've seen architectures like this before, you kind of know a lot of, a lot of the, 
the gains are really come from the PEs being able to talk to each other directly, um, talk to its neighbors directly instead of fetching memory, uh, data from memory every time. But eventually you have to go to memory, right? And so there's this memory subsystem um, on the chip that uses LPDDR5 um, and can scale up to 128 gigs of, um, of memory. There's also some SRAM on the chip for um, high bandwidth, low latency, very commonly accessed data um, by the PEs. Um, and then finally, you know, there's this dedicated control subsystem. It's the very little tiny thing um, in the corner, uh, but this is, this is what runs the, um, the system firmware, right? And this, this firmware uh, manages the, the compute and the memory resources, talks to the host, talks to the host driver over PCIe, orchestrates um, all the job scheduling and all of that. Um, and that firmware uh, was written um, using the, um, the Zephyr RTOS. The video process architecture is a, is a little different, a little bit more of a mess. Don't, don't tell them I said that either. Um, the, you know, the majority of it is just video transcoding, um, as, you, as you would expect. It's the, the core IP um, that, that does the, the hard work. Uh, there's also a memory subsystem using you know, LPDDR5, because we like to reuse things, um, but it's a little bit of less, um, less memory. And then finally, there is a multiprocessor CPU subsystem that then boots the accelerator um, and you know, runs firmware, does similar things, schedules, schedules jobs, um, follow, following um, whatever the host is asking it to do. That firmware, again, build on, build on Zephyr RTOS, because again, we like to reuse things. Um, all right, the software stack. I said that this was co-designed with the software stack. Um, the software stack is complex, I guess. It's an understatement. Um, at the very bottom of it is, um, is the, uh, the firmware um, that um, you know, we, we work on. At the very top is things like PyTorch and uh, recommendation models and, and, and the applications, right? Um, and there's been years of many, many, in, you know, many, many engineer years, right, put into working on PyTorch and working on these, these application, um, applications, AI applications. And so for us to come in and like immediately have impact and immediately um, be able to improve on what, um, what Meta has, like we, we, have to, we have to fit into that. We can't go and rewrite all the applications. And so this is where this middle, uh, middle layer comes in, right? In the, entirety, in the entirety of the middle layer. Uh, it basically takes the output uh, of existing applications, tries to find the kernels that we can optimize and run on the accelerator. It uses low-level code generation, is low VM compiler, um, and a tool chain with, with specific extensions, um, right? And um, takes these AI kernels um, and then finally creates these binaries um, that can then run on the aforementioned PE arrays, um, right? Uh, the, the, the PEs that um, we had earlier. Those, those little binaries then get scheduled on there um, through the, the host driver and then finally through firmware. Um, that, um, hopefully that makes, um, that makes sense so far. Performance of this thing. So um, I didn't run these benchmarks, so don't, don't blame me for the numbers. Um, I, these benchmarks were run for, uh, for the ISCA paper that was actually published last week. I think ISCA was last week. So if you want to know more, you can go read, um, read the, the, um, the whole thing. Uh, but generally, uh, we feel like we do okay. Um, we do okay on sort of lower complexity and medium complexity uh, recommendation models, uh, both in kind of size and gigaflops per, um, per batch. Um, I see some of you straining your eyes. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You can either look, look it up in the paper or you can just download the slides later from, um, from the app. Um, but like I said, generally we do, we do well. We don't do as well um, on high complexity um, um, recommendation models compared to GPUs. Um, but we think that we have some, some headroom there. We blame it on the software people. Uh, you know, we just, we, just need, we just need better software to run on this. Um, and it kind of makes sense for higher complexity um, you know, workloads. Uh, it's, it's, it, just, it just takes time to get to the maturity um, of, of software. Okay, um, specifically now back to firmware um, and you know, less of, of the marketing slides. Um, what, are, what are our challenges? What, uh, what do we do? Yeah, we, we, we write device firmware for both of these accelerators, um, and they're both based on the, on the Zephyr RTOS. Um, we use the LTS branch, the, the long-term um, stable branch. Yeah, Chris, go Chris. Uh, Chris is on my team. He's the maintainer for, uh, for the LTS branch. 
Um, and we, you know, we, we rely on upstream uh, for bug fixes and for security fixes. We do some work ourselves, but we mostly just rely on you guys. Um, and then the firmware runs on RISC-V multi-core processors. We basically have all of, um, I think most of, or all of our processors are RISC-V. Um, they're actually capable, capable things. I know, I know it looked like it was like a little, little thing in the corner, but it's actually a fairly capable multi-core RISC-V uh, processor. It's not what you would normally find in like an IoT um, device. Um, and so this is, that's, that's maybe you know, something that we've had to work on, on improving, um, even, even in upstream, the RISC-V support for it. Um, all right. So most of our development, most of the firmware development is actually done pre-silicon. Uh, before hardware shows up. Um, this is kind of a unique challenge because um, it also it means we have to also build and maintain the emulation capabilities uh, that mimic the target hardware. Um, and that's, that's also something that uh, kind of my team works on. Um, this is because as soon as hardware shows up, we want to we wanna be ready to go to production right as soon as possible. So we need hardware, we need firmware that, that works for you know, some definition of works. Um, and this is also where we leverage some of Zephyr's capabilities to target emulations such as Kimu and, uh, and native POSIX, right? It helps quite a bit to be able to, um, to test your, um, your, your code without real hardware. Um, all right, so this is, this is my, this is my you know, testing is hard slide. That's basically what it says here. Um, given the, the complexity of the software uh, stack, we, um, and the complexity is also in organizational, right? In like the number of teams that are actually involved in working on that software stack to the point where you know, teams don't even necessarily fully appreciate what, what the others are doing. Um, but we have, to, we have to come together and we have to test the end-to-end -end, um, stack to make sure that when hardware comes back, we have something that works and works well. Um, and this is, this is, this is hard. Um, I, you probably most, most of you probably believe me because we have to build a testing infrastructure that's, that's fairly complex, that runs application on a virtualized host, talking to firmware that runs on emulated hardware. This whole thing has to work, has to work reliably. Um, and, um, and this is something that we, that we invest uh, quite a bit in. Uh, for low-level firmware tests, uh, we've actually, we've, we're actually adopting, we, we, we rely on Zephyr's test framework, Zephyr's e test framework, um, and it allows us to write these, these simple faster to fail um, tests. All right. Um, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned integrating with Meta's infrastructure as one of the challenges, one of the hard things to do. Uh, one of the places we integrate that I can actually talk about is, is our build system. Um, so Buck, or Buck2, um, is, is Meta's build system that's written all in Rust. No? Yay, Rust. Uh, it's written, yeah, there we go. Uh, it's written all in Rust, um, and it's designed to be, you know, super great. It's open sourced, which is why I can talk about it, uh, and it's used by it's used by thousands of developers kind of every um, every day. Uh, it gives us a lot of leverage integrating with Buck because then Buck in turn integrates into many other uh, places at Meta, uh, places, you know, tools, and uh, and systems, um, things that give us better developer experience, better developer efficiency, but also things that give us better test uh, visibility or test um, test scheduling. Right? We kind of get all that by integrating uh, with Buck. One other kind of neat thing with Buck is that it's written to integrate with remote execution. So you're, you're able to write firmware or write any software locally and then build it and, and, and execute it uh, remotely. In our case, it's really convenient because you can write firmware locally and, and, and then execute it remotely on a machine that happens to have you know, a certain accelerator in it. Um, all right, and so I, I mentioned Rust. Um, Rust is now fully fully supported language at Meta. It's actually a recommended choice for uh, for, for for CLI tools, and um, you know the number number of kind of tools and services written in Rust is is rapidly is rapidly growing, um, and it's probably no stopping it, no matter what um, what people think. Um, and we've we've actually written some firmware in Rust, believe it or not. Um, and we actually see we, we see we see this as um, as something that's coming up, and um, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to support writing um, writing Rust firmware in the future. All right, we got some conclusions here. So just to kind of summarize, AI workloads um, they're kind of everywhere at Meta, um, and you know, custom um, accelerators are our way of extracting efficiency out of the resources that we have, being the year of efficiency if you guys heard that term before. Um, 
the software stack. It's a fairly complex beast, um, but at the bottom of it, we have, we have our firmware that's based on Zephyr, our TOS. Um, a lot of our challenges are meeting, meeting the performance requirements of, of, um, of firmware, but also kind of integrating into the infrastructure and, um, and, and, and culture. Uh, I don't want to understate the, the culture part. It's, it's actually, I've, I've been at Meta for five years. It's actually kind of interesting to see um, some of those challenges. Um, and then finally, in terms of like where we, in terms of our interests, right, being specifically around Risk Five and, and, and now Rust, this is kind of where we feel we can have um, uh, a lot of impact possibly on, um, on upstream um, in the near future. All right, um, that's it. Uh, my timer hits at 18, so I have some time left. I don't know if that means we're just done or um, <laughs> done. All right. I still have time left because I didn't plan for 18. <laughs> <laughs>